On the occasion of his 75th birthday, Freud received birthday greetings from the chief rabbi of Vienna. In response to those greetings, he wrote back to the rabbi saying, quote, in some place in my soul, in a very hidden corner, I am a fanatical Jew. I am very much astonished to discover myself as such in spite of all efforts to be unprejudiced and impartial. What can I do against my age? Now, how do we understand what it means for Freud to feel that he was a fanatical Jew? And furthermore, how do we understand what it means for any 75-year-old man in 1931 Vienna to feel he was a fanatical Jew? And even more for our purposes, what does it matter what kind of Jew Freud felt himself to be? He was an atheist, but a proud cultural Jew. But does it really influence our thinking about is there or isn't there, or what kind of relation is there between psychoanalytic thinking and Jewish thinking? The all too easy analogy would be with Einstein. Would we care what kind of Jew Einstein felt himself to be in trying to understand his contribution to science and to the world? I think we approach them differently. If we boil the question down, is there something Jewish about psychoanalysis? Distant cousins or strangers? Now, being both true to a, a Jewish hat and a psychoanalytic hat, as you might imagine, we are not going to get answers to those questions today. <clears throat> we are going to get, hopefully, more questions. But hopefully these questions will be more nuanced, be more historically based, and most importantly, will begin to take the latent issue that is common in the community, that there is some overlap between Jewish thinking and psychoanalytic thinking, psychotherapy thinking in general and have it be a topic of conversation, to, write, to raise it from the latent issue that it often is, and to have it be a topic for us to talk about both at this talk and in further talks. <clears throat> now, a bit about Freud, including his own words. Freud was born on 5-6-56. That's May 6th, 1856 the year they finished the construction on the Academy of Music. <clears throat> he was born in a small town in what is now the Czech Republic. His parents were from a long line of Orthodox and Hasidic rabbis. They moved the family to Vienna when he was four, and by most accounts, though not all accounts, then dropped all religious rituals and observances. Freud was raised heavily influenced by the Enlightenment of the time, and he became a precocious student. He was schooled privately by a rabbi, but later claimed no knowledge of Hebrew. The cultural environment within which he grew was on the one hand characterized by the newfound intellectual freedoms of the burgeoning modern era. Simultaneously, he found himself caged by the insistent otherness of growing anti-Semitism. He decidedly did not choose to ease his path through the route of conversion, as many others of his generation did. Quote, I was a Jew, and it always appeared to me not only undignified, but outright foolish to deny it. Freud surrounded himself with Jews, most of his friends were Jews, most of his colleagues were Jews, and most of his early patients were Jews. In search of a supportive community of like-minded secular Jews, he sought out the B'nai B'rith. Commenting in 1926 on his loneliness before joining, he wrote to them the following. This isolation aroused in me the longing for a circle of excellent men with high ideals who would accept me in friendship despite my temerity. That you were Jews could only be welcome to me. I find the attraction of Judaism and the Jews to be irresistible. And before long, there followed the realization that it was only to my Jewish nature that I owed the two qualities that have become indispensable to me throughout my difficult life. Because I was a Jew, I found myself free of many prejudices which restrict others in the use of the intellect. In addition, as a Jew, I was prepared to be in the opposition and to renounce agreement with the compact majority. 
As ferocious as Freud was in proclaiming his cultural pride, so too was he equally committed to protecting his young child of psychoanalysis from the dangers it faced in its hostile environment. He feared that given its Jewish birthright, that it would be dismissed as degenerate and disregarded, outlawed, and most importantly, misunderstood. He feared it being characterized as a mere Jewish science. His remedy was to find a Gentile leader who would, talisman-like, be able to protect it from the attacks of the anti-Semites and represent it as a universally applicable set of discoveries. He chose Carl Jung, a Swiss psychiatrist and a pastor's son. Eventually, their relationship and their understandings of how the mind worked led them their separate ways. For our purposes, it is worth taking note that the very Gentileness that Freud sought in Jung led him also to conclude that, as we say in today's language, that he just didn't get it. Writing about his difficulty with Jung to his close Jewish colleague from Berlin, Karl Abraham, he said, quote, please be tolerant and do not forget that it is really easier for you than it is for Jung to follow my ideas. For in the first place, you are completely independent, and then you are closer to my intellectual constitution because of racial kinship while he, as a Christian and a pastor's son, finds his way to me only against great inner resistances. His association with us is the more valuable for that. I nearly said that it was only by his appearance on the scene that psychoanalysis escaped the dangers of becoming a Jewish national affair. So it seems that at least at that time, <clears throat> Freud associated a Jewish mind with a facile psychoanalytic mind. That is our question. Do we really think there is something Jewish about psychoanalysis? Stephen Frosch, a British psychoanalyst, has approached this question and responded in this way. Relentlessly interior and self-reflexive, Jewish thought continually examines and interprets, playfully sometimes, with anguish at others. This too is part of the psychoanalytic response to the terrors and thrills of modernity. Freud claimed that his Jewish identity freed him from restrictions of the intellect, and in the end, he was grateful for it, whatever the costs. The crucial point is that just as post-emancipation Jewish identity is built on the knife-edged awareness of the potential and dangers of the modern experience, so is psychoanalysis. Each informs the other. Each is the product of the same underlying socio-historical process. Returning to the original fears Freud had about his work being derogated as a mere Jewish science, in 1978, Anna Freud, his psychoanalyst's daughter, was invited to give the inaugural lecture for the Sigmund Freud chair at Hebrew University. As part of her speech, she referenced the Jewish science question. Quote, during the era of its existence, psychoanalysis has entered into connection with various academic institutions not always with satisfactory results. It has also repeatedly experienced rejection by them, being criticized for its methods being imprecise, its findings not open to proof by experiment, for being unscientific, even for being a Jewish science. However the other derogatory comments may be evaluated, it is, I believe, the last mentioned connotation, which, under present circumstances, can serve as a title of honor. <clears throat> Last summer, <clears throat> my wife and I traveled, my wife and I traveled to Berlin. <clears throat> we visited many monuments, <clears throat> and the one that made the largest impression on us was perhaps the smallest. <clears throat> Picture this. <clears throat> There's a courtyard and it's surrounded by apartment buildings all around it, and there's a grassy area in the middle of it. And in the middle of that courtyard is a table, a simple table and two chairs. One of the chairs is standing upright, and the other chair is lying on its back. And the inclination that you have when you walk past it is to go pick up the chair, to right the chair, to fix it. It's a miss, it's a skew, there's something wrong here. And you go and you will feel the chair that's stuck on its back. And you will try to pick it up and you can't. You can't change the chair that's on its back. 
<clears throat> this monument marks an historical event that took place in that courtyard, courtyard and many, many, many other courtyards. What happened is this courtyard was filled with a number of Jewish families, and at times, the Nazis would come in and would interrupt the meal and would tear the family away from the meal, would tear the family away from the table, and would tear the family away from their lives. But it didn't stop there. What then often happened is that the uh, often non-Jewish neighbors would then walk into that same apartment, would sit down at that same table. They would pick up the chair, they would straighten the tablecloth, and they would finish the soup, and they would take over the apartment as their own. As if what happened didn't happen. As if this assault never took place. The chair was picked up. Similarly, <coughs> as Freud and Zaretsky and others have pointed out, our biblical Moses <coughs> goes to the mountaintop. And he goes to the mountaintop to find and declare and experience a monotheistic God, a gift he felt he would give to his people. And this God was to be of a different sort. It was to be a God that <coughs> one didn't touch, one didn't uh, one didn't see in the usual sense, in the usual literal sense, in the sensual sense. It was meant to elevate from what was otherwise a mere sensual experience to something different. And he came down the mountain and he saw that his people, they were having a tough time of it, shall we say. That when faced with frustration, that when faced with disappointment, that when faced with uncertainty, with not knowing, they turn to the familiar, they turn to the shiny, they turn to gold, they, they turn to idols that they could touch. That the ethereal, abstracted God was, was beyond them at that moment. Similarly, for those of us who've had the good fortune to be patients in psychoanalysis, and for those of us who have the added good fortune to be able to conduct psychoanalyses for all us humans. There comes a time where something is stirring in you. Something is bubbling up inside us. It could be a hurt. It could be an anger. It could be a tenderness. It could be a lust. It could be a tear. And without even knowing it, we turn away from it. Without even knowing it, we find something to distract ourselves from. We pick up the chair that's unsettling to us. We find some gold to distract ourselves with, something pretty to, to preoccupy ourselves with in order to turn away from the truth that's from inside us. And when all goes well in the psychoanalysis, the analyst and analyst and will work together at those moments and recognize and discover that the intolerance for that truth at that moment isn't really based on adult thinking and functioning. That, 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 that the notion that we can't feel and know this truth is, is defined and limited by our childhood way of thinking and that we can really be free from that. That we can bring our creative adult functioning to our own truths. So for me, <clears throat> whether we're talking about the Holocaust, or Moses, or Freud. To me, what they share in common is that when they are at their best, they offer us a freedom and a creativity and a maturity that will allow us to live our lives more fully. When someone about to introduce a speaker, the first speaker of a speaker series, what the, t the temptation to say what you usually say is, well, I looked far and wide, and I found this perfect match for our lecture series. That's the usual thing one says. Well, with no embarrassment, I want to tell you that I looked far and wide, and we really found a perfect match for our lecture series. <laughs> I met Eli through his writings. Uh, first through your paper, The Place of Psychoanalysis in the History of the Jews, 
which is, by the way, referenced along with many other papers of his and others in, on our website, jewishthoughtandpsychoanalysis.com. And from that paper, his book, Secrets of the Soul, A Social and Cultural History of Psychoanalysis. And what was so special to me about the book is I've read lots of books about analysis, many by analysts, many by non-analysts. And what so struck me is that those books that are written by non-practicing analysts generally don't really get what Freud was about, don't really understand the essence of what Freud brought forth as a helping model, as a, as a model to understand the mind in a brand new way. And to my astonishment, Eli's book, Secrets of the Soul, he really does get it. He writes like a seasoned clinician, and I kept going back to the bibliography, the biography, to say, is this guy an analyst? And he wasn't, but he really writes like a seasoned analyst. It's a treat. But not only that, he also writes from the social history perspective. So he has the best of both. He really understands the inner workings of the mind, and he also understands the context with which our minds work socially. So I took a chance, I called him up, and here we are. Uh, professor Zaretsky is a professor of history at the New School for Social Research in New York. He has written many books. They've been translated into many, many languages. He has spoken all over the world. And I also hope to hear more about his forthcoming book called Political Freud. Professor Eli Zaretsky, a pleasure. Thank you so much. Harvey, and, and uh, thank you to the uh, synagogue for inviting me. It's a, it is a great honor to uh, launch uh, this uh, uh, series, and it's, um, it's a really a pleasure to, uh, although it's Holocaust Remembrance Day, it's, it's, it's very meaningful to me to be able to talk about these ideas um, in a synagogue. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Moses and Monotheism, uh, Freud's book that uh, was published in uh, 1939. And of all the important books of the 20th century, this one is one of the most difficult to um, understand. Freud was very old in his 80s when he wrote it. He was, he was sick with cancer. It was written in the shadow of the uh, Nazi uh, terror. Uh, it doesn't really, it's not really based on real historical um, research and the thesis of the book, namely that Moses was an Egyptian and uh, so forth, that the Jews uh, killed him uh, and that they are burdened with the memory of killing him is you know, very um, implausible. And Freud starts the book by saying it's a hard, it's a difficult thing to write a book where you're depriving a people, the Jewish people, um, of their national hero and their national, uh, so he apologizes at the beginning of the book. Um, and uh, after the book was published, of course, uh, World War II, the Holocaust, um, all the interpretations of the book, uh, the, the, the first wave of interpretations also attacked Freud, criticized Freud for that, for not appreciating what it is to be a Jew. Um, and um, they centered on understanding what is the meaning of the book for understanding Jewish identity. What is, what is Jewish identity? And that is the basic uh, thesis that has run through all of the writings on Moses and uh, monotheism uh, since then. Uh, probably many of you know there were a whole series of debates that uh, Jacques Derrida and Yosef uh, Yerushalmi uh, engaged in about uh, 15 years ago, again, what did, what did Freud mean by his Jewish identity? What is, what is a Jewish identity uh, for Freud? And then um, m most recently, uh, Edward Said uh, praises uh, Freud for the way in which he describes Jewish identity because according to Said, um, Freud puts the Egyptian uh, inside the Jewish experience rather than seeing uh, Egypt as another. So he thinks of uh, uh, Freud as a pioneer of contemporary uh, 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 understandings of identity. And Freud himself, uh, in his letters and so forth, uh, also uh, suggested that what the book is about is Jewish identity. He said, what I'm writing about, he said, is what has really created 
the particular character of the Jew. And how has the Jew, uh, in view of renewed uh, persecutions, drawn upon himself uh, this undying hatred, in other words, anti-Semitism in relationship uh, to uh, uh, Jewish uh, identity. So there is a lot of truth that the book is about Jewish identity, but uh, I think, I'm going to argue in this uh, talk, that uh, at a deeper level, the book is uh, not about Jewish, uh, not primarily about Jewish identity, but is actually motivated by his worries concerning the survival of psychoanalysis. Writing the book while he was dying and in the course of being driven into exile, Freud was well aware that psychoanalysis could be stamped out just as quickly and surprisingly as monotheism had been stamped out in ancient, ancient Egypt. For Freud, the survival of the values he associated with the discovery of the unconscious was far more important than the survival of the Jewish religion, which he considered of little value. And even of the of Jewish ethnicity, which he did value, he was a fanatical Jew and so forth, but he valued it in a completely different way than he valued uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, and so at the heart of the book is really the survival of psychoanalysis. Uh, of course, you ha we have to remember that when he was writing the book, he did not know about the Holocaust, which uh, has you know, changed all of our perceptions of um, what is going, uh, 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 of what was going on in that period. Um, furthermore, he didn't um, con uh, consider, it was not just a book about the survival of, of psychoanalysis alone, but in general, the book is concerned with how spiritual and intellectual gains in general, what, uh, what is their character and how can they be, how can, how can they be preserved? So the book really should be looked at, not just a, a book in psychoanalysis, it really isn't a book in psychoanalysis per se. It's one of the great books about World War II. You want to, put, you want to look at Moses and monotheism along with books like Eric Auerbach, Mimesis, which was written in exile um, in uh, Turkey, Hans uh, Barron's book, The Crisis of the Italian Renaissance, Panofsky's work on uh, perspective and so forth. What was going on at the time of World War II is that people were really asking what is, what is really of the highest spiritual value, uh, intellectual and spiritual value in our uh, civilization. What are we fighting for? What do we want to save and uh, so forth? And Freud was trying to situate psychoanalysis in that context as one of the great uh, human uh, gains that was threatened by the whole catastrophe um, of the war. Um, and especially, the book is very aware of Nazism. It is written in, in the context of Nazism. And Nazism demonstrated as no other, probably no other current of 20th century did, why you needed something like the theory of the unconscious to understand history and to understand mo uh, modern life and so forth. That something uh, so sustained form of hate and destructiveness could break out in the country of Bach and Goethe, in the country that had created the modern university, that had pioneered modern literacy, literacy demonstrated that our sense of ourselves as progressive and enlightened civilization um, was, uh, you know, ha ha was fallacious. And um, uh, Freud was uh, putting the uh, context of uh, the discovery of psychoanalysis, the importance of psychoanalysis, how, how little we really know about ourselves and what, what the power of what goes on in human uh, beings um, in that context. Um, nor was Freud only thinking about what the rise of the Nazis meant uh, in terms of destroying uh, the idea of the unconscious, destroying the kind of gain that psychoanalysis uh, uh, had uh, meant, because that was sort of easy to see. It would have already taken place. The Nazis had wiped out um, psychoanalysis in, um, in uh, uh, Germany through violence, uh, as, as Harvey was uh, talking about. But also, Freud was concerned, and this is more, more uh, subtle, how a spiritual gain can be lost from within, how it, it, it could lose, and how you could lose uh, uh, something that you thought you had gained uh, and that you thought was secure. Because that is what, in Freud's view, that's what happened uh, to the Hebrews. 
uh, they had this precious game, and that's the, really the Bible's view too, the, the prophet's view and so forth. They had, the Hebrews had made this uh, terrific uh, spiritual and intellectual gain, but it was disintegrating into empty ritual and following of laws and so forth. And Christianity, which uh, also claimed to be a spiritual breakthrough, degenerated into cults of martyrs and uh, saints. And Freud, so Freud felt the same thing was happening to psychoanalysis. So it wasn't only the violent side of the suppression of psychoanalysis in uh, the Nazi world, but actually the disintegration of psychoanalysis above all in the United States, which was by that time becoming the world center of uh, uh, psychoanalysis and where Freud was totally at the center of American civilization in terms of film and culture and before TV, advertising and uh, uh, and, and, and the like. Uh, and so he, uh, he's looking at uh, two forms of uh, disintegration. So what is it in psychoanalysis that Freud thought was so important and why does he draw upon the Jewish experience, the ancient Jewish experience, uh, to understand um, what, it is in, what, what it is in psychoanalysis that is so easily lost, uh, so easily forgotten, uh, or, so, or, or so violently suppressed, because these are really both uh, going on. Um, and um, his word for it is Geistigkeit, the German word, Geistigkeit, uh, which um, I there are various ways of uh, translating it, like Geist uh, for Hegel, spirit, you know, and uh, uh, so forth, but prob probably the way I like to translate it, inwardness or uh, subjectivity. Um, and um, what, uh, what is really important uh, for Freud in uh, the Jewish experience, in the Hebrew experience, is this, it's one of these incredibly great moments, the discovery of monotheism, not the idea of one God, because you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't believe in that or anything like that. It's the prohibition on graven images. It's the build of boat. You shall, you know, you shall not make a, a picture of God. Why is that so important? Because all the other religions are making pictures of God because it's reassuring, it's sensual, you, things you can touch, things you can envision. And um, the Hebrews, and, and Harvey brought this out in the um, Golden Calf and so forth, uh, the Hebrews are uh, thinking about a God that um, you can't touch, you can't see, you can't uh, feel. And that drives you out of the world of just instinctual gratification and sensuality and empiricism, and it forces you into a, a, a world of conceptual thought. Uh, and that's what he means by geistekite, that's what he means by uh, spirituality. And this is very much part of his German-speaking world, his education, as Harvey said, the Enlightenment, this idea of, Geist, of a conceptual world, not just an empirical, a sensual uh, world, but a world, a philosophical world, an intelligible world, a world of thought. But it also corresponds to something very deep in uh, Jewish history, and I'll elaborate that, and, and that's Kedusha, the sacred. Uh, so uh, uh, Freud is drawing upon, and in a cer certain way, bringing together German philosophical thought uh, with, with Kant, uh, who is, you know, which which is centered on how we become subjects through concepts, through living in a, you know, having a philosophical way to grasp the world. He's bringing that together with the Hebrew world of a sacred realm having to do with the fathers, the law of the fathers. And when I say the fathers, I don't mean the men. Uh, I mean the tradition, the law. Uh, that's what Freud meant um, more than anything. Uh, he's bringing them uh, together and he's situating psychoanalysis. Uh, it's not reducing psychoanalysis to either of those, but he's situating the discovery of the unconscious in that um, uh, context. And that's what he means by uh, a spiritual gain, and uh, I think the point he's trying to get at in the book is how hard it is to, um, uh, to hold on to something like that, how endangered it is. And he, you have to see he's writing this in 1939 uh, as, as the war is, is about to uh, uh, break out. 
So let me uh, show uh, now how um, Moses and monotheism uh, is related to his understanding of uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, and I'll do that, first of all, by summarizing uh, the argument uh, of Moses and monotheism according to Freud. So the basic argument is one man created Judaism, Moses. He did this by choosing a circle of followers. This is the idea is Moses came and chose the Jewish people. They were just a people in Egypt. He did so by choosing a circle of followers and initiating them into a difficult practice based on instinctual renunciation rather than gratification. His followers, after some enthusiasm, rejected his practice as too, too demanding, effectively returning to the idol worship from which Moses had rescued them. Eventually, his followers killed Moses, and a debased Judaism triumphed. Nevertheless, the repressed memory of Moses' ascetic doctrine, monotheism, survived and was rediscovered centuries later by the prophets. So that's a summary of Freud's argument in Moses and monotheism. Now let me just make a few obvious substitutions and you'll see what I'm getting at. One man created psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. He did so by choosing a circle of followers and initiating them into a difficult practice based on instinctual renunciation rather than gratification. His followers, after some enthusiasm, rejected his practice as too demanding, returning to the idol worship from which Freud had rescued them. Eventually, his followers killed Freud, and a debased form of psychoanalysis triumphed. Nevertheless, the repressed memory of Freud's ascetic doctrine survived, and its secrets, too, would be re rediscovered centuries later. So you see the parallel, and so what, what I'm going to uh, do in this talk is uh, elaborate on uh, that parallel and, and bring out the way in which uh, uh, Jewish experience, the, the Jewish character of psychoanalysis, because it definitely does have, as we will explain, a certain kind of Jewish character, but not religious, uh, but Jewish, uh, and uh, so forth, illuminates um, psychoanalysis and um, uh, the way in which psychoanalysis also illuminates Judaism. Um, and um, I'm going to do that f by following Freud's analysis of the Jewish experience. So Freud says there are five moments. So these are the five moments. In the first moment is when the Jews are presented with the idea of monotheism, with the idea of uh, one God. And this is the moment of Geistekeit. This is this incredible moment. It raises your self-esteem when you are above the mere senses, the, out, the outward, the appearance of things, and can actually penetrate to the, you know, uh, to the essence of, of, of things. The second moment is um, the, the chosen uh, people, the sense of being chosen. And this is, you know, fantastic because the Jews feel superior to all the other people of uh, the Middle East, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Philistines, the Egyptians, and so forth, because they're all subordinate to the senses. They're running around and, 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 and worshiping, you know, cows and, and birds and rivers and so forth. And the Jews have this, what Freud calls it, their sacred treasure, which is the idea of one God that you cannot see, that created the whole universe, and uh, so forth. That's the experience of the, um, the chosen people. Um, the third um, moment is guilt, uh, the, the, the importance of guilt, because you can never live up to this sense of chosenness. And Freud has, I think, a very interesting explanation of why guilt and chosenness uh, come together, which I'll come to in a, in a second. There are always the Jews, I mean, just, all you have to do is just read the Torah. We're not living up. We're not doing what God, what uh, we covenanted with God uh, to uh, do and uh, so forth. The fourth moment is the moment of assimilation. Just drop all the specialness and the chosenness and uh, the guilt and uh, go back to, you know, 
uh, sensuous polytheism, and this is linked to the idea of mother gods, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, and then the fifth moment is the moment where there are prophets, and that's the moment when you can never really, once you have a spiritual advance like psychoanalysis or like monotheism, uh, you, you never really, you, you, you suppress it, and you can, they can suppress it for centuries, but actually it's going to come back. People are going to rediscover it the same way the prophets uh, rediscovered um, what, the, uh, what the Jews um, um, uh, uh, had, had originally stood for. Okay, so these are the five stages, and I'm, I'm going to uh, lay them out. So the first stage is the stage of, when, of Geistigkeit, or the stage of, uh, uh, of monotheism. So Freud starts uh, in Moses and Monotheism. He says, all religions are based on, on some historical truth. And this is the same thing about how, how he analyzes human beings. When they tell their story, they never really tell the true story any more than a religion tells us a true story. The Torah is not the true story of the uh, Hebrew people, but there's an element of uh, truth in it. And you have to know how to read things, you have to know how to read pay, uh, people in order to be able to get back at that truth. And what Freud is saying in Moses and Monotheism, and uh, trying to say it you know, in a reasonable way and, and so forth, um, is that the element of truth in uh, in, in, in the Jewish religion uh, is uh, that uh, Moses was an Egyptian uh, prince. This, many people have uh, said this because otherwise you have to believe the story about the, uh, what's her name, putting the baby into the water and then being picked up uh, by an Egyptian princess and so forth. That's sort of not very, really very plausible. Uh, Moses was um, a, uh, from the high court, and that what was happening in Egypt at the time when the Jews were there is that there was a religion for the common people, which was a sensuous, polytheistic religion, but at the court, where you had highly uh, uh, educated uh, individuals, they were, uh, uh, they, they were developing a monotheistic ideas. This is associated, this is there was a very good historical reasons to think this. This is associated with Ignaten, uh, sometimes called the first individual in um, human history. Uh, and uh, then they were persecuted. Uh, the people at the court were persecuted. And so Moses fled the court, according to uh, Freud's attempted reconstruction. Moses fled the court and came and chose the Jewish people. This is why we feel, I'm Jewish, obviously, uh, that's why we feel uh, chosen, because Moses chose us. Uh, and um, he chooses them because he needs, because this message of monotheism is so important and it's being wiped out at the court and he needs a people uh, to, um, to um, uh, carry and preserve this message. Now, why do the Jewish people, why do the Jewish people respond uh, so powerfully uh, to Moses when he comes to them with the message that there's, that there's only one God. Um, and here you have to really sort of go a certain way with Freud, and I hope you'll sort of go with me because it does take a while to get into his way of thinking, but once you become familiar with it, you really can't um, deal without, you really can't proceed without it. And um, it's that Freud has a certain idea about civilization, and it's an obsession, and it's a, a mythological obsession. It's wrong, but we don't have real, really understandings about civilization. We need mythological things like the social contract theory and so forth. We, d we have various ways of trying to grasp uh, what what, what are the foundations of our civilization? What is its basic dynamic and so forth? And so for Freud, the basic thing is civilization starts, justice starts, law starts, thinking, starts, regulating indiv relations between individual starts with the murder of the primal father. Originally, there's a primal father, the father is killed, and then the sons, the brothers, uh, create the family, create law, create uh, kinship relations, and uh, so forth. And obviously, um, you know, this 
obviously did not happen uh, in, in that way. And Freud understood that in Moses and Monotheism. He said that in an earlier book, he had described it as if something like that really happened. Now he thinks it's something that is describing a process that occurred over, uh, over centuries and so forth. But you do have to have uh, his conception of the foundational power of a father. And this is why he thinks uh, psychoanalysis uh, is, is, is linked to the Jews because the Jews have a sensitivity to what he calls the repressed historical memory of, uh, of the father. We are closer, according to Freud, uh, to, the, to that um, understanding because, of, because we're monotheistic and we're not Trinity, we don't have a Trinity, you know, we don't have uh, Virgin Mary and so forth. It gives the Jews a particular sensitivity. So when Moses comes uh, to the Jew Jewish people uh, and presents this idea, they immediately, they get it uh, because it's a repetition. He is a great father figure uh, to the Jewish people. They're used to the idea of a father. They are very close, part of Freud's thinking is that we can't really understand very early events like Moses and uh, uh, the Hebrews. Uh, these are extreme, they're like events that occur in human infancy. These are massive, incredible uh, things that occur very early in human history and in human life. And they, you can call them traumas, they stay with us. Uh, and so the Jews sort of know something about uh, the, uh, uh, about the killing of the uh, father, they sense it, and, they, and, and the killing of the father is really the awesome power of the father, and so when Moses comes, uh, they, um, they respond. Um, and, um, and, and, and Freud explores what, uh, that, the power in this first moment, what the message really is, is, is Geistigkeit. It's a way of going above uh, your uh, immediate needs and your immediate uh, senses. Uh, and he, said, he describes what's going on in, uh, in Egypt at that time that produced uh, 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 Moses, uh, which is uh, the, the idea of, a, of one God, which was the sun God, which is certainly not quite the Jewish God, but still it's a picture that the Egyptians had of a round disk uh, that um, emanates from uh, the sky. Freud calls it almost rational. So the really, the, what's really powerful about monotheism is, the, is not, not God. Uh, he is very clear, he is an atheist. And not the Jewish religion, because as fanatical a Jew as he was, he, he was not uh, gonna go to the synagogue or uh, you know, practice uh, the Sabbath service or something like that. Uh, but rather the intellectual, the, the spiritual and human gain that's involved, uh, first of all, with monotheism. It's not the only moment, uh, but um, it's a, a, a crucial uh, uh, moment. And um, this, uh, uh, so what's really important, as I said, is, uh, is uh, the build of their boat. And so this is then uh, the first moment of, um, Jewish history, according to Freud, um, but um, it's also the first moment of um, uh, psychoanalysis, because this is the moment when Freud is alone, and he says he's struggling with his own father, uh, with, his, uh, with father figures in his life, and he, he says the most important thing in a man's life is the death of his father, how important that is in producing his first book, The Interpretation of Dreams, and what's what's the interpretation of um, uh, dreams about? It is, it's a huge geistekite step. It's a huge spiritual step to be able to actually see dreams as meaningful. It's, it's an incredible thing uh, because, you know, dream is just a series of images and Freud develops a way of turning these images into language and reflecting upon the language that is uh, uh, produced. You can't know what your unconscious, as Harvey very well, as an analyst, as Harvey very well said, you don't know uh, what uh, your unconscious uh, thoughts and uh, feelings are 
uh, but you have to uh, infer them. You, 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 you can figure them out. And um, there's really for, uh, uh, for Freud in this first uh, step, there are, um, there are really two points of reference. He does say that this is really the discovery of the unconscious. The discovery of the unconscious is like the discovery of monotheism. It's just a, u it's a huge spiritual advance. It tells you, it completely revolutionizes what you think a human being is. Um, and uh, Freud says it's like Kant, Immanuel Kant, the great uh, thinker, German-speaking thinker of the uh, 19th century, because Kant says you can't know the, the thing in itself. You can't tell directly what uh, reality is like. We can't mistake our perceptions for the thing itself. And this is the same thing that Freud says. You can't m you just think that your psyche are the ideas that you have in your consciousness and mistake them for the unconscious. You have to go through a process of uh, inferential thought uh, to, uh, to uh, come to that. And as I say, um, uh, Freud is not a philosopher, nor is he a theologian. He's a psychoanalyst. Uh, and um, uh, this also has uh, the uh, connotation, this is also connected uh, to um, Kedusha, because the things that are buried in our unconscious for Kant, they're not metaphysical categories as they were uh, for Kant, but they're actual memories of our parents and our grandparents and of the tradition. They're actual people, and that's sacred, that's the law. Uh, that uh, we don't, that is in us, and that um, uh, we don't uh, know. And, and Freud is like Moses in that when he makes this discovery, um, he, needs a, he needs followers, he needs a people, and he goes, and where does he go, as Harvey said? He goes to B'nai B'rith and all his early talks, he goes to the Jewish community, the same way Moses did. Uh, and uh, all of um, his, uh, uh, early talks, and he was known, he was called a representative, because he had studied in France, he was called a representative of the French school uh, in Vienna, but that was a way of saying Jewish, French was a way of saying Jewish, you know, he was known as, uh, uh, you know, as, uh, for uh, his Judaism, as, and, uh, as, he, as he said, that uh, psychoanalysis was always in danger of becoming uh, a, um, a Jewish national, um, new Jewish national affair. So that's the first moment. The first moment is the moment of uh, Geistigkeit, whether it's monotheism or the unconscious, uh, is, is the first moment in his, uh, uh, in his analysis. Uh, and then the second moment is the moment of chosenness. Um, and uh, um, there, there's a, just, I think it's a wonderful story. Uh, there was a British Zionist who was a psychoanalyst named David Ader, E-D-E-R, um, and um, he had a correspondence with Freud. And when he died in 1936, Freud recalled when they had first met, and Freud wrote, we were both Jews and knew of each other that we carried in us that miraculous thing in common, which, inaccessible to any analysis so far, makes the Jew. And I think all Jews understand that. You know, you just, Jews have a sense of having something special, uh, some being chosen, being a chosen people. Uh, and what is this miraculous thing that Jews feel they have and that Jews recognize in other people? And of course, this is very politically incorrect and so forth. But uh, you know, nevertheless, uh, there it is. Uh, what is this um, uh, miraculous thing? It's, this, it's the, uh, having uh, had this uh, secret treasure of knowing that uh, God, you can't touch God and feel God. It's it, that, you know, uh, it lifts you above the um, uh, uh, senses. And, um, Freud writes about Moses, the whole idea of a God choosing a people, making it his people, and, and so forth. It's the only, I, I think it's the only case, he writes, in, in you, the history of religions. Most religions, the God and the people arise together. They, they, they start together or people adopt another God. But here we have a case of a people. Uh, Moses had stooped to the Jews, made them his people. They were his chosen uh, people. 
And um, this is also very difficult to be chosen, to be special. Um, and um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, because it, it is a spiritual game, but it's a spiritual game that you have to live up to. It's easier to um, live in the world of, uh, uh, of senses. Uh, it's, it's the gain, what is the gain above all? It's the gain of having a law. I'm going to come back to this. Freud calls it, anyway, the triumph of spirituality or geistigkeit over the senses, an instinctual renunciation. Um, and um, the Jews, after Moses, felt superior uh, to those who remained in bondage of the senses, but at the same time, they felt burdened by guilt. Uh, and what was, what was the guilt? The whole relationship uh, to the father starts with a murder. It, it is, it is a, uh, it's not like we just start out obeying uh, uh, the father. No, we start out uh, with a murder. So the same thing that is the spiritual gain of creating civilization and uh, doing away with the primal father, creating a law, creating justice amongst us, that same moment is burdened by a feeling of guilt. And of course, this is in Freud's uh, theory, the Oedipus complex and so forth. There's, there's also, with civilization, this is really fundamental uh, to, to Freud's conception of civilization and Freud's conception of the Jews and the Jewish role in civilization and Freud's conception of psychoanalysis is how powerful the sense of guilt is. Uh, and this is why uh, he thinks it's so hard for people to accept psychoanalysis and uh, so forth. This is so powerful and he's struggling to understand, as I'll explain in a second, he's explained now what it is to be a Jew, why Jews uh, feel chosen, but this is also linked, as I'll explain in a second, uh, to um, um, anti-Semitism. And right from the beginning, when he goes to B'nai B'rith and he finds these followers, and at first they are all Jewish, and then he brings in Jung um, and uh, so forth, right from the beginning, uh, you have um, the attack on Freud, the same way you have the attack on Moses in uh, the Bible, uh, uh, too much guilt, uh, and it's really an attack on a father, on a father figure, uh, and you get right away, very early in the history of psychoanalysis, you, ha you, you get alternatives uh, to uh, psychoanalysis, improvements, revisions, we're very, very, very much, we have the idea of progress and always improving, you know, we're always improving. And we lack the um, idea that is so central to Freud of regression and losing, how we lose things and forget things. We don't think about that. We only think about progress. So right away you get very progressive revisions of psychoanalysis, and one is Jung's. And Jung's is um, basically um, uh, Christian. Uh, or at least that's how Freud saw it, and that's how Freud's followers saw it, and so forth. Uh, because it's going to do what Christianity did, and that is give you a way out of the guilt. Um, and um, what is the way out of the guilt? It's the sacrifice of a son. And as Freud analyzes why Christianity was so powerful and why it, you know, captured 90% of the Jews of that time. I'm not really sure if it was, I, mean, I shouldn't have said 90%, I don't really know, but a very large number of Jews and a very large number of non-Jews. It swept the Roman world and so forth. Um, it's because of the freedom. It's the good news. Christianity is the good news. And Freud says it had to be a son. Uh, you had to have the sacrifice of a son because the original sin was the, um, was the uh, murder of the um, of the father. And this then is the key to Freud's understand, Freud's theory of anti-Semitism because the Jews reject that. They reject that, that path of uh, release from uh, the guilt that uh, Jesus uh, has saved us. So in a way, it's a world without redemption. You're still stuck with um, the original sin, Adam and Eve, or um, or whatever um, in, um, uh, in Judaism. And so the Jews originally 
uh, before Christianity, they were seen as clannish because they had this idea about one God and so forth. Uh, so there was some kind of anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism, let's, let's call it anti-Judaism, I think is a better term, uh, before there was Christianity. But then after Christianity, it really gets intensified because it, it's a reproach to Christianity. It's saying we, you, have, you, you think you have a solution, but you don't really have a solution. In the same way as psychoanalysis was a reproach to um, the um, uh, to the alternatives that uh, were offered, first of all by Jung, uh, and on the other hand uh, by Adler. And Jung's, uh, Jung's alternatives stressed um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, collective unconscious, got the individual out of the problem of dealing with their own life and uh, so forth, uh, and, uh, but right away from the, and, and Jung is not really anti-Semitic, and he, nor is he really uh, Christian, but he's very, he has a kind of religious thing, and he does see Judaism, as Freud, as Anna Freud did, as a Jewish science, and um, uh, I'll just read you a little bit from the letters at that time. Uh, one of Freud's uh, followers, who was Jewish, says, Jung identifies confession. He thinks that psychoanalysis is like confession. Psychoanalysis is not confession because confession is, uh, you know, makes you a good person in uh, the light of the Father. The purpose of psychoanalysis is not uh, to confess sins, it's to demolish the Father image, the Father Amago, Ferenzi says. This is completely absent in, uh, in, um, uh, psychoanalysis. And the other thing is, um, it, it's for the community. It turns, it's good for, for Jung, uh, the whole purpose of therapy is to bring you into the community. And this is where Freud is uh, talking about being willing to be in the minority and rejecting the compact majority. What is the com compact, what is the, what is the majority? What is the community? It's the band of brothers. Uh, and uh, it's a reconciliation. It's a philosophy of um, reconciliation, of brotherly love. Uh, and uh, Ferenczi uh, writes to Freud, don't you see that in Jung's uh, psychology, the father plays no role. The, the community of brothers takes up um, all the space. And uh, Freud was very uh, caught in that moment between um, Jung, who gave psychoanalysis a public uh, face that was, uh, you know, that uh, freed it from uh, the anti-Semitism uh, and um, uh, his, uh, his differences uh, with, um, with Jung. And Harvey read that uh, wonderful quote where he says to Abraham, don't you see it's easier for you as a Jew, Jews are especially sensitive to the repressed historical material that is their tradition, our tradition, the Jewish tradition, meaning uh, the guilt uh, for the um, relationship uh, to the father. And uh, Freud writes uh, to uh, Abraham, don't you see, uh, it, it, by, be, by virtue of being a Jew, it's much easier for you to make your way to the whole knowledge of the unconscious, because what is the knowledge of the unconscious? It's the knowledge of, of uh, Kedusha. It's the knowledge of a primal murder. It's the knowledge of the law and the defiance of the law and the guilt that goes with the law and the guilt that goes with being a human being and uh, so forth. Um, and you are, it's easier for you to come to that uh, than uh, uh, for a Christian. And he actually says, cultivate, he says to, writes to Abraham, and Harvey didn't quote this, but he says, cultivate a little masochism. Uh, in, your, uh, in your relationship uh, to uh, Jung. In other words, the Jews, it, it, which actually applies in general to the, to the, uh, to the Jewish um, um, uh, situation, in other words, cultivate a little masochism in order to fit your ideas into the larger Christian uh, sense of community and sense of universality and uh, uh, so forth. And I, I won't uh, do the uh, the counterpart on, um, on Adler, who really represents 
not, not a Christian alternative to psychoanalysis, but a sort of democratic, social democratic uh, protest uh, to uh, uh, psychoanalysis. But you do have, right from the beginning, uh, this uh, struggle. And the third part of um, the analysis is, um, is about uh, guilt. And I, uh, I, I want to move very quickly here. Um, because, you know, I want to make time well, for many reasons. Um, but um, it, it, in, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quote from Freud to capture his thinking. He says, the sons loved the father and they hated the father. Uh, and uh, after the murder, they transform both of these instincts into guilt. Freud writes, ambivalence is a part of the essence of the relation to the father. It's built into the instinctual life. It's built into our earliest uh, relations, is ambivalence. Um, there was no, and this is very important to understanding uh, how Freud thinks about this. There was no place in the framework of the, religious, of the religion of Moses for a d direct expression of the murderer's hatred of the father. Um, uh, all that could come to light was a mighty reaction against it. A sense of guilt on account of that hostility, a bad conscience for having sinned against God and for not ceasing to sin. And this is really important for understanding psychoanalysis, for understanding Freud. You are not guilty because of what you did. Yeah, there, was, there were, were events. You're guilty for what you think and for what you feel. Um, and that is, you know, makes this very, very, very powerful. And the way I talk in the paper, and I'll go quickly, uh, about the, um, this third moment is uh, to show how Freud really becomes more and more isolated uh, in the course of his uh, life. By this time, there really is a, uh, there is a psychoanalytic movement, and uh, he has many followers. He's a, a uh, worldwide uh, figure, and so forth. And at the same time, at the very climax of that, you have the rise of the Nazis, the destruction of psychoanalysis in the, um, in the um, uh, uh, German-speaking uh, world. And you also, the experience that, um, that uh, psychoanalysis goes through of struggling for its own survival in the context of being caught between, on the one hand, Nazism, and on the other hand, uh, the, the uh, uh, power of the United States at that point, uh, the Jews are in the same situation, and both communism and America, uh, America with its very positive psychologies of encouragement, psychologies of, of uh, mind cure, psychologies uh, that uh, tell you what you can do, not what you're suffering from, and so forth, these are uh, uh, real uh, alternatives to, to Freud at that point. And he comes to focus more and more on the question of the death in instinct and the questions of uh, guilt, and also how difficult, how impossible uh, psychoanalysis uh, itself is. And that's when he formulates the theory of the superego. So what he's doing all the time, he's taking these things that are mythological, like uh, a father figure like a primal father, but he's turning them into theories of psychology that actually can make sense and can actually have scientific uh, ground. So you can really understand a person through the, the idea of id, ego, and the superego. The superego is the representative of the father, of the law um, uh, within us. Uh, so uh, he's, he's, he's constantly developing uh, a genuine uh, psychology. He says, um, uh, he, he says, you know, uh, the superego makes the man, superego stands over the ego. There's something in us. We don't, we're not just our ego. You know, we have something in us that stands over us and tells us to give up, uh, renounce uh, 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 instinctual uh, gratification. And when we do that, we feel uplifted. It, we're proud of it. And the superego is the successor and representatives of the parents. So it's the parents. But 
the parents and the whole experience of having parents and growing up in that situation is also a human experience that in which we are being echoed by the whole past of the human species, the traumatic events that we have gone through uh, in the past and that um, uh, uh, stay with us. And this ends, Freud says um, also in monotheism, what seems to us so grandiose about ethics so mysterious and in a mystical fashion so self-evident, this is right, this is wrong, owes its characteristics to its connection with religion, its origins from the will of the Father, which sets out to work compulsively and which refuses any conscious uh, motivation. So uh, he's really, in a way, he felt very um, isolated at that point. Um, the fourth uh, stage is uh, the stage of assimilation. Uh, and Freud says uh, this is the stage when uh, Judaism becomes, uh, gives way to Christianity. And the whole idea is when something takes on a mass form, it's diluted and vulgarized. And of course, this is what he thought was happening to uh, psychoanalysis. The new Christian religion, Freud wrote in his, his words, meant a cultural regression as compared with the old Jewish one as regularly happens when a new mass of people break their way in or are given admission. The Christian religion did not maintain, we see this in revolutions all the time, the Christian religion did not maintain the high level in things of the mind to, um, uh, to which Judaism had soared. It was no longer strictly monotheist. It took over numerous symbolic rituals from surrounding peoples. And unlike Judaism, Christianity reestablished the great mother goddess and found room to introduce many of the divine figures of polytheism only lightly veiled. Christianity, as Freud analyzes, is really polytheistic. I mean, the saints, the martyrs, uh, the trinity itself, many people uh, uh, saw the way in which this idea of one god, one father figure uh, gave way and the importance of the uh, of the mother goddesses. And I think what's most important to understand about this, I won't um, go into the whole argument. I don't think we should read, I think it would be wrong to read uh, Freud's point here as um, just, uh, you know, sexism. He's not really a sexist. Of course, he's an old fashioned, has old fashioned attitudes toward women, but he's not uh, a sexist uh, in, in some, some, you know, when we use the term uh, sexism. What he really thinks is that the advance to a patriarchal religion is not really an advance to male domination. It's a spiritual advance. It's geistekite. So that what we live in a world, in the world of the mother goddess, we just know the mother directly. But when we go into the world of fathers, we can't know our fathers. We know our, fa our, our, our we can't know our fathers directly, the way we know our mothers. We are born out of our mothers, but we're not born out of our fathers. So who is our father? To have a father, uh, you need law, you need kinship relations, you need marriage. And so he's really uh, saying, and I, this is really important. Uh, for Freud, that to live in a world of two sexes, and also Freud thinks that every single one of us is not composed of two sexes, but makes two sex, two um, uh, sexual, ob different uh, sexual object choices. When we see it in infancy, who do you love more, mommy or daddy? We do that as adults, we go back and forth. Every, everybody does that. It's fundamental to Freud's way of thinking about it. So I think that's really the way to understand uh, the, the uh, that moment uh, in uh, assimilation that um, he, um, uh, he mocks. And also, it's very important to Freud's understanding of gender. It's not a direct thing. It's something you have to, again, think about. It's something spiritual, and it's the same thing about being Jewish. Uh, I, I thought Harvey was going to read the famous quote where Freud said, I don't believe in God. I do not read Hebrew. I am not really a Zionist, he was sort of a Zionist, but you know, I have doubts about uh, Zionism. Uh, so what's left uh, being in being a Jew? A great deal, probably the very essence. We don't know scientifically what it is, but there's something there. So Jew, to be a Jew is mysterious what it is to be a Jew. This is, is something we have to think about in terms of Israel and so forth. It is a mystery. Uh, but it requires uh, thinking about. And it's the same thing as far as gender. It's not obvious 
what makes a person, what is a man, what is a woman, and uh, so forth. They are spiritual questions, Geistiger questions that require uh, understanding the unconscious mind, having a sophisticated understanding of um, uh, history, and uh, 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 so forth. Um, Freud dies just right after um, writing uh, Moses and uh, Monotheism, um, and that raises the question how to understand the history of psychoanalysis, just like how to understand the history of Judaism after Moses, how to understand the history of psychoanalysis after Freud. Uh, Freud writes, it would be wrong to break off the chain of causation with Moses uh, and neglect what his successors, the prophets, Jewish prophets, achieved. Monotheism had not taken root in Egypt. It started, but the same failure might have happened in Israel. From the masses of the Jewish people, however, and here we're coming to Jewish identity, there arose again and again men who lent new color to the fading tradition, re renewed the admonitions and demands of Moses, and did not rest until the lost cause was once more regained. And so you can look at the history of psychoanalysis in the same way what their later prophets, and you constantly have return to Freud, whether Lacan and so forth. Okay, um, and um, uh, okay, I think I've probably, I think this, you want me to stop at this uh, point, or shall I say a few words uh, in, I'm going to signal that uh, I've gone on too long, so. Uh, yes, okay. So finally, what, what does this mean? First of all, it shows, it brings out the connection of psychoanalysis uh, to Jewish history. It's the issue of the law, the issue of the father, and the sensitivity of that. Secondly, it, it, it brings out how to understand uh, World War II, the specificity of the Jewish question uh, to uh, World War II. There's something, there's something special about it. It also brings out um, something about how to understand uh, History, the idea that history, like the human mind, we have to understand it archaeologically. It has things that have happened in the past. They're not really just past. They're still there, just like things that happen in our infancy uh, are um, uh, uh, still there. Um, and uh, finally, um, it, this being Holocaust, so it, it's really one of the great books about the Holocaust. It's one of the great books about understanding World War II. I'll talk about it in the uh, question and answer period. And finally, I would return to its place uh, for, Jew, for Freud as a Jew and his relationship to um, the question of uh, Jewish identity and uh, so forth, uh, because he says in, in, in the book, he says, it's proof of a cyclical fitness in the mass that which became the Jewish people, that it could bring forth so many persons who were ready to take upon themselves the burden of the Mosaic religion. The Jews are always in exile, they're always displaced, and yet they are constantly going back to this moment uh, that starts with, uh, uh, with Moses, constantly producing new people who are willing to take upon themselves the burden of the Mosaic re religion, even if the stimulus had first come from the outside, from a great stranger. And I think you could look at Freud as himself being a stranger uh, in the uh, context of uh, the Jewish uh, people and in the context of the moment when the Holocaust is really taking shape. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you made some um, uh, parallels between Kedusha and uh, the Jewish unconscious. But um, it's been two generations since Freud wrote this. It's been two or three generations since Freud wrote Moses and Monotheism. Um, in, those, in the last two or three generations, a great many American Jews, I think, have, don't have the connections that Freud, even though he was an atheist, had. Uh, and certainly in Europe, um, people have, Christianity is not an active at least in Western Europe, is not much of an active force. Does that mean that this is a, an historical analysis, or do you think the psychoanalysis depend upon having an active Jewish identity, whether it's atheists or whether, but having some kind of connection that many people don't have anymore? The relationship of psychoanalysis, I don't think that psychoanalysis has a Jewish identity. 
Um, I think psychoanalysis, um, uh, and Freud didn't want it to have a Jewish identity. Uh, so it, d it did have a Jewish identity and it, and it didn't. Uh, it had a Jewish identity in the sense that it comes out of a, um, out of, out of a specific cultural uh, situation. You have to, we have to really uh, think why the Jews played such an incredible role in um, the in 20th century thought. The writers, the thinkers, you know, the scientists, okay, Einstein, uh, but um, you know, the, in, in terms of literature, in terms of philosophical thought and so forth, it has a specificity to the Jewish situation in Eastern Europe and in uh, the German world. They're outsiders, that's fundamental. They are coming into this moment when the universities are uh, expanding, but they are, they are also outsiders. They don't share uh, the dominant uh, uh, view, uh, the dominant assumptions uh, of, the, um, of the culture. But there's also something very specific to the Jewish situation um, at that time. I never really, and, and I think Freud is getting, that, getting at this, and it's the sensitivity to the father, in quotes. Um, and um, I never really fully understood this until I studied Kafka, uh, because um, Kafka's worldview, he's a contemporary, more or less. He's the next generation, but of course he dies much before uh, Freud. It's very much the same worldview. It's a worldview where there's a powerful law and where powerful feelings of guilt uh, exist and uh, so forth. And the person who really helped me to understand what was so Jewish about Kafka and by analogy about Freud is Gershom Sholem, who you know is the great Jewish historian of Jewish mysticism who, who, who emigrated to Israel in uh, 1923. And Sholem said what, what, what you see in Kafka, it's a world without redemption. Christianity offers a redemption. And uh, it's, it's a world without redemption. It's a Jewish world. Try explaining this to the Goyim, uh, Sholem says. Or you know, Gentiles, please excuse me for that vulgarity. Um, that was very specific. Since then, psychoanalysis became a world mo movement. It's probably stronger now in Catholic countries. Freud did not understand the power of Christian thought on some of the same questions of guilt uh, that uh, he was concerned with. And he also didn't really. Um, you know, there are plenty of Jews, Martin Buber, for example, and many other Jews who think of God as very touchable and feelable and sensual, and probably many people feel that way, so Freud had a very uh, particular take on it. But in no way uh, is psychoanalysis uh, today. It's an international movement. Uh, it, 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 you know, it has uh, all, all, all sorts of other currents on it. Does that, does that answer your question or not? of my talk is to question um, the assimilation of, uh, the Amer of the American Jews, absolutely. And I, I think that um, if you think psychoanalytically, you have to, um, you have to uh, question easy forms of Jewish identity and Jewish assimilation and Jewish closeness to what we call, I mean, I, I didn't have time to really present it, what comes to be called the Judeo-Christian world and the assumption, which is extremely alien, uh, to Freud, and why I think mo Muslim and monotheism uh, is so important. Um, that we all sort of, we really, Jews and Christians, you know, we just basically, we have the same God, and we all sort of share a worldview. This is something that is, develops after World War II. And that's when you get this pushing aside of Moses and monotheism. No one will say Moses and monotheism is an important book about World War II. So there's huge debates after uh, World War II about what was the meaning of the war and what does the West stand for? What is the Cold War? It stands for Judeo-Christian uh, values. And I think you, I would look at that as a kind of regression, a kind of uh, step backward. I think probably the most interesting thing that has been written about Moses and monotheism recently has come from a Palestinian who, who is Edward Said. And he, sa you know, he says that Freud is about the other, as the Palestinian is the other. 
uh, as the post-colonial is the other. So Freud is about the eruption of the other. So yes, uh, I think the relevance of this is that it unsettles uh, easy forms of assimilation and the easy assumption that we know what it is to be a Jew and, uh, you know. Two questions. One is about this Judaism because almost, it seems to me you might have the opposite problem. I mean, there's a lot of discussion of assimilation, but there's sort of opposite problem where Freud, for someone like Freud, I mean, I'm thinking of Isaac Deutscher's essay on the non-Jewish right. Jew. And for someone, for Deutscher, you know, a, a person like Freud, the whole idea of Judaism, in a sense, it's a particularism that rejects particularism. Right. Um, it's a particularism, like a particular ethnic identity that it, because of the way it sort of understands you, you experience suffering, um, you reach out to a sort of abstraction through right. a denial of this particularism. That's right. Whereas it seems like in the present, if anything, a lot of Jewish identity has turned much less to a kind of embracing of a, a sort of non-complicated, non-problematic, a sort of nostalgia right. for a Jewish cultural identity, rather than the sense that sort of, in a way, what it means to achieve the fullness of Judaism is to violently reject Judaism, as Freud did, and to achieve a kind of like universality and a, a universal understanding of he suffering. He never rejected Judaism. He rejected the Jewish religion. Yeah. 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 Um, anyways, that's one just sort of straight thought. The other okay. question let, I had... Let uh, me answer that. Okay. Uh, and and um, no, come to the... Um, all right, go on. Give me the well, the other question was, you said... Um, psychoanalysis was a science or a, a philosophy of instinctual renunciation. Right. And it seems to me, a tension I've always, you know, I'm perpetually sort of trying to figure out in Freud's work is on the one hand, Freud seems to be like, you know, a warrior for sexual liberation. Uh, someone, someone who to some degree wrote in, you know, a number of his works about the cruelty inflicted on individuals uh, in oh, the society yeah. by the constant demands for renunciation and who, you know, recommended reform of um, civil, you know, reform of uh, more generally repressive mores. On the other hand, there's the Freud who thinks that, you know, what the failure of civilization is, is the kind of return of the repressed in a more violent form and a kind of total release of aggressive impulses. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what you think about the, the tension between, or, or the sense that when Freud's talking about renunciation, mm -hmm. um, He's also saying that this sense of guilt and this eternal conscience is, in a way, the, the impossibility of renunciation because the impulses come back and they come back actually stronger right. and more right. aggressive and more right. violent. I gave a version of this, uh, uh, of this paper uh, at a hospital and they were all psychiatrists and social workers uh, uh, in New York um, and uh, there was an older man and basically, we just sort of gathered questions and comments afterward, and there was an older man. And um, I wish I knew his name, because I would have liked to pursue uh, the discussion with him. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, Freud was just wrong. His pessimism was completely uh, misplaced. Uh, and that's why we've made so much progress uh, since Freud's day. I, I, I said to him, well, from, from your mouth to God's ear, I hope. I hope you're right uh, that we have made so much progress uh, because for, you know, uh, but um, I often, I feel in so many ways that um, we have to really have, not, and Freud really was not a, a pessimist. He was not Kafka. Uh, he was much more optimistic and much more uh, uh, on, on the positive uh, side uh, um, of, uh, you know, of, of that. Uh, but I do feel that we need, um, uh, let's say skepticism, to use uh, Montaigne's term. We need some of Freud's uh, skepticism because I definitely feel that we need the concept of regression. We have to really see how much gets lost because I'm just very struck, uh, for example, this is not about Judaism or psychoanalysis, but just in terms of the current economic uh, crisis, since it broke out in 2007, people walk around as if we never had an experience of an economic crisis, we never had a new deal, we didn't understand Keynes. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's all like, oh, this is the first time uh, we, you know, we can't do that. Just like a, an amazing um, uh, 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 amount of regression. And I think we have to understand, uh, basically, um, you know, regression 
doesn't just occur uh, with um, Hitler-like figures, uh, if you want to say Putin uh, or something like that. It occurs under the guise of um, liberal platitudes about how complicated everything is and we don't really understand things and uh, you know the world is full of you know compromises and so forth. Uh, that's you know that's uh, just as in psychoanalysis uh, it, it, it the, the dangers didn't just come through violent repression but they come through internal platitudes in which we are constantly it's all about narcissism, constantly building ourselves up and describing ourselves as more progressive, having a more complicated worldview, really advanced, and so forth. So I do think we need uh, some of that skepticism. But I'm not sure that this guy who said uh, Freud was wrong and his pessimism was misplaced, and that's a, we, because we didn't follow that, we've made a huge amount of progress since then. I'm not, I'm not sure that, that, he, uh, that he was wrong. On your first question of the, uh, concerning the non-Jewish Jew, I quote from it in the, in the full paper, and I, uh, you know, it's, uh, Deutsche's essay is a great essay. Deutsche was a Trotskyist, Marxist, Polish Jew, um, and one of the great historians, biographers of the 20th century, and wrote a wonderful essay called The Non-Jewish Jew. And these are all of these Jews, like Spinoza, Heine, Marx, Freud, and so forth, that come out of the Jewish world you know, in certain ways embody Jewish values, but which was true of just almost all the Jews of that time, they want to be part of modernity. They didn't, the Jewish world was little villages in Eastern Europe and people you know, doing the same things over and over again. And uh, I mean the same you know, rituals and reading the same books as if there, nothing had been written since the Torah and the Talmud and so forth. And they, they wanted to be part of uh, modernity. So yes, there is that very strong sense in the Jewish experience of leaving behind a particularism for universalism. But I do think, I'm an historian, and I think psychoanalysis and uh, history uh, share. I mean, I'm sure that Harvey would agree with me that you cannot really know anything about a person until you actually discover, and that what you discover is gonna be very concrete and specific to that person. And it's the same thing with history. History is not really just like universal advances like Judeo-Christianity or the Axial Age. It's actually made up of very particular events. So I think this non-Jewish Jew doesn't quite go on. Uh, I think that your main thesis that in many respects, uh, Moses and monotheism serves as a proxy for uh, Freud's own reflections on the achievements of, of psychoanalysis and, right. and just how how fragile uh, any kind of uh, achievement of, of inwardness or or, um, uh, 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 or intellect really is, especially in, in the area uh, of fascism and, and, and uh, 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 fascism with, with a mass uh, movement at that. I wanted, though, to uh, just express like one of my reservations in, in accepting this, though, is the uh, close similarities you see between Moses, uh, b between um, Freud's characterization of monotheism as religion on the one hand and psychoanalysis on the other, um, specifically because it was very clear that psychoanalysis was not, was not a religion. And right. in, in that respect, um, uh, Freud, as a, a proponent of, of enlightenment, recognized that religion as a basis for society had fallen apart and some new secular uh, practices and uh, uh, perhaps even a science needed to literally replace it, which needed to follow much different laws and, and ways of relating to, to society. So uh, what, what's actually very peculiar to me about this work actually is, is that in Freud's own mind, perhaps, the close affinity of monotheism with uh, uh, psychoanalysis and his achievements was certainly present. But I'm not sure that it necessarily reflects the psychoanalytic movement as a whole, taking under its wing many new uh, developments in, in, in practitioners who identified very strongly with, with, uh, with Freud's own, own work, like Otto Fenichel and with Wilhelm Reich and, and, and so forth, but nevertheless not so, so, so deeply committed to the, um, the more ascetic, uh, perhaps, uh, commitments of, of Freud himself. Right, no, uh, no, I, no, I, I agree. Uh, the, uh, the psychoanalysis um, 
uh, in the classical, I, don't, I think the way that Freud, uh, we know quite a bit about how he practiced uh, psychoanalysis and it wasn't exactly ascetic uh, in the sense that, you know, they shared, they drank tea, you know, that, that it was more uh, it was conversational and so forth. Um, you know, when it was taken over in, in the United States in the early period, uh, it, it, it could be quite sadistic and sexist. It was a horrible, um, you know, um, adaptation. And the, it was really the movements of the 60s and women's liberation, gay liberation that transformed psychoanalysis and brought in the need. I have a personal trainer in a, in a gym and he's constantly saying to me, oh, awesome, that's fantastic, you know, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, uh, I always uh, tell my students the greatest psychologist of the 20th century is um, Skinner because he demonstrated that only positive reinforcement works. Negative reinforcement doesn't work. So Freud didn't understand that. But that doesn't mean um, that um, he really, he wasn't getting at something there. And I think on the religion thing, I was looking for a quote. He has a, um, um, he says, um, he says, um, if the power of religion, the power, we, we see this in Islam, um, the, pa we, uh, you know, uh, the power of these uh, uh, religious moments and religious uh, events and religious leaders have had um, in human history. And this is where I think you have to really um, see, get the model uh, that Freud has of archeology. span And he uses the image of the, um, uh, levels in Rome. So when you go to Rome, you can see medieval Rome, you can see ancient Rome, you can see contemporary Rome, and they're all there together. And it's the same thing in the human mind. You can see a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and a 80-year-old all in this, uh, at the same time, and it's the same uh, thing in history. There are moments in history, and they stay with us, and he, and he thought you know, religion was uh, important in that way. And he says in Moses of Monotheism, if a, if a religious tradition were only based on conscious or explicit communication, like you should believe in God, you should do this, and so forth, it would just be listened to, judged, and perhaps dismissed like any other piece of information from the outside. It would never, this is Freud, it would never attain the privilege of being liberated from the constraints of logical thought. It must have undergone the fate of being repressed because it's been liberated from logical thought. Somebody tells you, you know, there's a guy, oh, very interesting, uh, you know, but it's the power of a command. Somebody, I heard a guy give a paper on uh, how they practice psychoanalysis underground in communist Czechoslovakia, and he said it was like Freud gave a command, do that, go there, start an institute do that. He said they were just heard that always in there. So it's like Moses, you know, it's a command and it, 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 it li it's liberated from the constraints of logical thought. It must have undergone the fate of being repressed, the condition of lingering in the unconscious before it is able to display such powerful effects on its return to bring the masses under, under its spell. So yeah, and psychoanalysis has uh, never been uh, a religion. Thank you.